Hello, um, my name's Dr Alex Penn and I'm from the University of Surrey. Uh, I work on a project called the Evolution and Resilience of Industrial Ecosystems, which is basically about applying complexity science to, uh, to industrial ecosystems, systems of industries connected together by material and energy flows, as well as social and economic connections. And I'm going to, uh, I'm going to give you over the course of these three sessions an introduction to what industrial ecology is, and then I'm going to lead you through a design process, um, basically combining a whole systems design approach with the ideas of industrial ecology so that you can construct your own industrial ecosystem based on a design brief that I give you, and then evaluate it. Um, this will help you think through the concepts and the issues in, around industrial ecology. So, firstly, uh, the outline of this first session, what I'm going to talk to you about first is just give you an overview of what is industrial ecology and, and why should we do it um, in a bit more detail, uh, types of industrial metabolism that exist uh, in, in this context and the concept of industrial symbiosis, which is effectively how we construct industrial ecosystems. I'll briefly uh, go through an example, the sort of paradigm example in industrial ecology in Denmark, which is Kallenborg Eco-Industrial Park, and you'll go through that a lot in your reading material and evaluate what's happened there. Uh, I'll give you a couple of examples of some industrial symbioses, and then I'll set you up for some further thinking, which you'll be doing in your, in your session. I say, so firstly, some definitions. Well... What's an ecosystem to start with? We're talking about industrial ecosystems here, but an ecosystem generally is the sort of the set of interactions between a community of species. So these species themselves, but also their particular abiotic environment. And this was a concept that was developed by Howard Odom. And this is quite closely connected to the concept of metabolism, which should be familiar to most of you from a basic understanding of biology. So metabolism being the sum of the processes sustaining an organism, the production of new cellular materials and the degradation of other materials, altogether producing a dissipative structure, which is an organism constantly taking in energy and materials to maintain its structure. Metabolism doesn't just apply to organisms. An ecosystem itself has a metabolism, a set of, flow of flows of energy and materials, and Industrial systems also have a metabolism. So we have this idea of an industrial metabolism. So we can look at, we can use these concepts of metabolism and ecology to look at industrial systems directly. So an industrial metabolism is basically exactly the same idea, but we consider the flow of materials and energy through an industrial system and then the interaction of that system with global biogeochemical cycles. So we can map the system in terms of its metabolism. And then following on from this concept immediately, we have an idea of how we might use it, industrial ecology. So thinking of the industrial system as an ecosystem, we can apply ecological theory to industrial systems. So we could just think of the industrial world as a human ecosystem, um, embedded in local biological ecosystems, and the local biosphere, um, we can use then the tools of ecology to map and understand what's happening in the system, but we can also aim for sustainability by and manipulate this system by using these tools. So some basic concepts here in industrial metabolism, we think of there being three different types of industrial metabolism. So firstly, a linear metabolism, and this is what most of our industrial systems look like today. So we have a large input of resources and energy of different kinds. They go into the system, and then waste products are produced coming out of the system, and they generally have to be dealt with in some way. There's pollution or there's work done or cost involved in getting rid of those waste products. But in terms of... Um, the structure of that system, it's effectively linear. So most programmes that move towards sustainability in, uh, in the industrial world uh, move this kind of metabolism towards what's known as a semi-cyclic metabolism. 
So the idea here is that we limit the resources that are coming in. We're not just taking in as much as possible. And we do some sort of recycling inside the system. We're constructing an ecosystem there. And then we have reduced waste products coming out, but we still have waste going to landfill. We still have pollution going on. So this is better, of course, than the linear metabolism. But what we're ultimately aiming for, and the ultimate goal of creating an industrial ecosystem, is a closed-loop metabolism, a cyclic, a fully cyclic metabolism. So this is basically what the biosphere looks like. We just have energy coming in from the sun, and phosphates and things are being um, brought, up, brought in from rocks as the ecosystems developed. But in the main, the resources and energy in biological ecosystems are being continually cycled round, and all that's coming in is solar energy. And this is what the biosphere looks like. So this is our... This is our goal, our ultimate goal for what our industrial ecosystem should look like. And then they should be far more materially sustainable, quite evidently. So how do we go about starting to do this? Well, the first key point is really to, to think of waste differently. So if you think back to the linear metabolism... We've got huge numbers of waste products going out of the system. Uh, they're pollutants or they're things that have to be dealt with. And there's normally a cost involved in dealing with those, those waste products. Either it's a cost to the environment or it's a monetary cost. And then we have large numbers of resources going in. Again, costly and taking work or energy to put in the, obtain and put in these resources from outside the system. We want to go to a, <clears throat> think more of a concept of what happens in an, a biological ecosystem. If you think about a, a woodland ecology, for example, then you don't have this linear metabolism going on. You have a cyclic metabolism, and all the uh, materials and nutrients in a woodland ecosystem, for example, are for the most part bound up in the organisms themselves, the trees, the animals, the plants, and also in the soil uh, and the degrading material, the decomposing material of the ecosystem. In ecosystems like this, waste is a resource. Nothing is wasted. Every organism that dies goes to the ground and is decomposed, and there are a whole suite of other organisms and species that will use it as a food source. So all waste products in ecosystems are used as resources. You don't tend to get wasteful ecosystems. Well, that's a very big generalisation, but in a sort of mature ecosystem, you wouldn't tend to get this kind of waste. So this is what we're going for, and this is our sort of rule, really. Waste is a resource. Think differently about waste. <clears throat> so what are our strategies, then, if we're trying to think differently in this way? How do we construct an industrial ecosystem using waste as a resource? Well, effectively, we use this concept called industrial symbiosis. So... Symbiosis in biology is two organisms living together in close physical association. Um, typically, it's the advantage of both, although really in, in ecology, we would talk about that as a mutualism, but the term used in industrial systems is industrial symbiosis. So what we're thinking about in an industrial symbiosis is making beneficial connections between industries. So, for the most part, we think about waste products and how they can be used as inputs for other industries, but it can be far broader than that. So there are many kind of definitions of what an industrial symbiosis is, and it's helpful to actually look at a couple of them. So Jürgen Christensen, who's the driving force behind the Kallenborg Eco-Industrial Park, would define industrial symbiosis as collaboration between different industries for mutual economic and environmental benefits. So we have mutualisms that work both in terms of the environment, but also, crucially, they have to work economically for the companies involved as well. A broad definition that's, that's widely used by Marion Churto is that industrial symbiosis can be thought of as the reuse or recycling of one or more companies' byproducts or wastes or excess utilities, things they're not using, as primary resources, as virgin resources within their local industrial network. And these industrial symbioses can be a pairwise interaction between two partners, or they can involve multiple partners. 
So a couple of examples just to illustrate this. Well, I mean, power stations, coal-fired power stations, are often big, important hubs in industrial ecosystems because they produce a lot of byproducts. So <clears throat> some key industrial symbioses that are very common associated with uh, power stations would be, for example, the use of fly ash. That's the ash that basically goes up the chimney in the power station in cement. So this has some of the same properties as cement. So when you put this fly ash into the cement making process, you reduce the cost for the making of cement because you're using a waste product. You're reducing the cost to the power station because it's a hazardous waste product they'd otherwise have to pay to get rid of. And of course, you're reducing carbon dioxide emissions because you've only got that one-time emission from the burning of the coal, whereas to produce the cement, you'd have an additional carbon dioxide uh, emission. So this works economically and environmentally for both partners. Another sort of material example from a coal-fired power station would be the gypsum. There's a commonly, very commonly, a connection between gypsum industry, plasterboard industry, and power stations because the sulphur dioxide scrubbers that most power stations have in their chimneys actually produce gypsum as a byproduct. And this is um, then sold on to plasterboard, plaster manufacturers at a lower price than them buying in the raw material or mining it. It obviously reduces mining. And again, it's a hazardous waste product that the power station would have to pay quite a lot to get rid of. So there's both economic and environmental benefit for both partners here. Other very common examples um, <clears throat> and very interesting examples with power stations are well, it's waste heat and the different types of waste heat that can come out of a power station. So a power station really produces an enormous amount of heat. As I'm sure you know, uh, the power station works by burning coal to heat water and produce steam to turn turbines and generate electricity. But you end up with, uh, and they do a lot of cycling themselves in their interior processes, but there's still an enormous amount of waste heat produced. So high-grade steam at high pressure and high temperature can be used locally to the power station and it's often used in oil refineries or other nearby factories and if you can put in place the utilities, the pipelines, often with a shared cost between the two industries, then you can significantly reduce um, the cost of um, heating your own steam for your oil refinery and the power station can sell its steam. I mean, this requires putting in place infrastructure but it prevents heat, local heat pollution, and again, it reduces the amount of CO2 that's having to be produced because you're not heating twice. You're using the heat effectively as many times as possible between source and sink. So again, this is one of the key principles we try to use. Power stations also produce lower grade heat of lower pressure, lower temperature steam. And this is very commonly used, um, uh, particularly in, in countries other than Britain, for district heating. So you, if you have the infrastructure in place, if a municipality or a town works with a local power station, then you can actually just pipe steam directly into people's homes with a system of pipes, and so people are heated by the waste heat from the power station. This kind of waste heat can also be very effectively used in fish farming, where you want to raise the temperature of the water to increase productivity. And it's also often used in greenhouses, again, to raise the temperature and save all those environmental costs. Now, I'm, I've quite deliberately used the picture of Battersea Power Station on the bank of the Thames in London here to illustrate this, not just because I think it's a beautiful power station, which it is, but if you notice... If you look at that power station, you'll see that it doesn't have any cooling towers. So the big towers, the chimneys that you normally see associated with power stations with enormous clouds of steam above them, these are a sign that the heat is being wasted from those power stations. The steam is just escaping. When Battersea was built, it was built with a district heating scheme. So it heated Pimlico in London. So it was built to be integrated into the city. And this sort of starts to touch on some of the issues we have when trying to put industrial symbioses of this type in place, because what really prevents this happening now, certainly in this country, is planning law. How close 
kind of power station B to habitation. People don't tend to want power stations in their cities anymore. And normally you wouldn't be given planning permission to build houses right next to a power station. Steam cannot be transported effectively or cheaply long distances. So you have to be close. Physical proximity is key to making these kinds of associations. And the same thing is actually true with uh, fish farming or greenhouses in this country, not in the rest of, of the world necessarily. But the planning permission would mean that zones would be uh, allocated for industrial purposes and fish farming and greenhouses wouldn't necessarily be given permission to build next to a power station. So there are often regulatory, political and just social boundaries to these things happening and they can be as important, if not more important, than the technical issues in, uh, in the outcomes in our ecosystems. So I've given you a lot of links and reading materials for you to have a look at Kallenborg Industrial Symbiosis Network. And this really is the sort of poster child for industrial symbiosis. It's a, a long-established resource-sharing network of companies in Denmark with numerous partners it's interesting because it's self-organised by the companies involved. It's sort of developed from the bottom up. No one was imposing this as a top-down plan. It's a regional network and it's, it's now extremely successful and the municipality has invested in infrastructure to develop this further. Um, this is the network as of 2010. You'll have plenty of opportunity to, to peruse this in detail in the reading material I give you, but you can see that it's quite an extensive network with many companies involved, but that the coal-fired power station is really at the centre of that network. OK, so what you're going to do now, I'm going to, I've given you a lot of reading material and I want you to go through and... Make sure you understand the basic concepts of industrial ecology. And then during your session, I'll ask you together to just discuss those concepts and, and evaluate them and make sure you understand them. And then I will have given you a lot of reading material, as I say, about Kallenborg Eco Industrial Park. So I want you to start to list examples that you've come up with from your reading material or your own knowledge of different industrial symbioses. Understand how they work and then th evaluate their benefits to each partner. Remember, we try to make... Uh, we want eco ecological benefits, economic benefits, but we also really need, in our ideal industrial ecosystem, social benefits. So I want you to consider for each of these industrial symbioses, do they have all of these benefits? Do they tick all of the boxes? And if so, what are they? And then to think about, in the cases that you've read about, what were the barriers to those symbioses being in place and what were the enabling factors? And then that will lead you on to think about if industrial symbioses or industrial ecology were implemented in your own country, in your own context. I want you to start thinking about what would be the challenges and barriers in your own context. And this will start to prepare you for the design exercise that we'll be doing next time.